Got everyone. It. Let's welcome in Stephen Tobolowski, and don't say you don't remember him because he sure as heck fires remembers you. <laughs> Sorry, all of you. I remember every. You know that now. You would think now. Now, Tim, you would think that Groundhog Day would would be which that was a line from. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, a line from Groundhog. You would think that that would be kind of a universal aperitif that everybody would know that and seen that movie. But I just worked on a project where uh, one of the major actors in the project go, um, so, you know, what have you done before? And I said, well, you know, I always just kind of look at them and figure like, well, what have they seen? Should I say Californication or Groundhog Day? Or, you know, what, what should I, which, which way should I go? And, and I go, well, Groundhog Day. And they said, oh, yeah, I haven't seen that. I heard it's a good movie. How can and I'm you going not like, see that? Yeah, exactly. How can you not see it? The reason you, can, you have not seen it is that, Tim, time marches on. And it's like the cruel, cruel thing I've learned in this pandemic. As you know, we've all gotten older without the benefit of having accomplished anything or done something. We've had two years of our lives just siphoned away where we've been inside of our little rooms and, and hoping to make the most we can out of what little opportunities we have. And then we realize time marches on. And it, it's not the same anymore. Nothing is the same anymore. And, and, and that's... <laughs> But I, I don't want to get too grim at the beginning of the Tim podcast, but, but just to say that uh, I appreciate the uh, Groundhog Day reference in that it still exists. And it's amazing because it's what, 40 years old, something like that? 30 years old? Let's not go that old. old. 27 years old. We'll just go with that. Yeah, yeah. Are you 27? I'm 31. I'm You're a, 31. I'm okay. So... They did uh, a study, you know, of baseball, you know, baseball players and everything. And the top age, the, the age in which you reach your peak is 26 and 27. And then after that, you begin to go downhill. So you, my friend, are on the downhill slide, even at the, the cub-like age of 31. You're on your way to the grave. So, so like, make the most of whatever you can out of this joyous time. We're here. That's what. That's how I live life nowadays. You know, just yes. live it, do <laughs> it, have fun. That's the secret of life. Yep, yep. So I've got to say, what's some of your favorite roles that you've done? Favorite roles. Well, to begin with, certainly Groundhog Day was one of my favorites for a lot of reasons. And you have to understand, one of the most popular reasons isn't that, oh, the movie did well. Because when you're an actor, you have no sense when you're making a movie or when you're doing a project, whether it's going to be good or not. You, you assume it's going to be good because you read the script and you like the people in it. Uh, but Groundhog Day was good for a lot of reasons. It was good because I got to work pretty much exclusively with, with Bill Murray. And I, everyone has all these stories about Bill and his, uh, how his eccentricities and, you know, whatever. One of the greatest comedic actors I've ever worked with. Absolutely, bar none. Every take he did was committed. Every take he did was in the moment. Every take he did was filled with life. And it was just a great experience for me working with him, and it was a great experience working with Harold Ramis. I learned so much about comedy just in my sitting down, my little conversations with Harold Ramis in between shots. It, it was just wonderful and <clears throat> lovely cast, you know. So Groundhog Day was one of my favorites. Um, I, uh, I had uh, one odd favorite, uh, Last Flight Out. It was a TV movie uh, with Arliss Howard and James Earl Jones and Richard Crenna. And a wonderful cast. Uh, Hang Noor. Yeah, it, just a wonderful, wonderful cast. Uh, but what was great about it, it was a TV movie, and we shot it in Bangkok. We shot it in the jungles of Thailand. 
And so for a TV movie, they flew me out first class from Los Angeles to Bangkok. And let me tell you, you know, when you fly first class to Asia, you know, you're treated like, you, you know, a billionaire. It, it just, and behind me was this little Asian woman all curled up in her seat and she was kind of sleeping like a little kitten. And I'm thinking like, oh, wow, this is, and there was like nobody else kind of there. We had first class kind of all to ourselves and we take this huge long flight to Thailand and we get out at the Bangkok airport and you're of course ex completely exhausted from the flight and I get out and there were thousands of people waiting for the flight screaming because of the little Asian woman behind me. <laughs> I had no idea. She was the she was the Elvis Presley of Vietnam. She was their lead the leading actress, you know, Q Chin. She was she, magnificent actress. Uh, in the Joy Luck Club, she's the mother who has to leave one of the twins behind if you if you ever saw that movie. So like all of a sudden there Richard Crenna became my best friend in the world. And the, he is the funniest man, was the funniest man on earth. And just the experience of being in Bangkok and then being in the jungles for a month was amazing. And my wife back in the United States gave birth to our first child. That's, that's beautiful. So I'm coming back and I'm going to be a daddy. So that was huge doing that movie. And um, one more little James Earl, jo James Earl Jones was in this movie. When I was a kid growing up in Dallas, one of my favorite actors in the world was James Earl Jones. Uh, he was just a huge star at the time. Uh, he was just breaking out as, as one of the biggest stars in the world before he was the voice of CNN and, and ABC and everybody else and, and uh, Darth Vader and whatever. You know, he was the, uh, the Great White Hope, I think, was that breakout movie of his. Uh, just incredible. And then of all things, when I was a student at SMU, they decided to rehearse the Broadway production of of Mice and Men at SMU with James, starring James Earl Jones. And so James Earl Jones was in our drama department. And I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe, uh, you know, I'm getting to see the guy close up. I'm getting to see him perform. And then I'm acting with the guy in Bangkok. I couldn't believe it. And then I acted with him in Sneakers. So I got to see James Earl Jones time and time again, and both of us were invited to uh, uh, George Lucas's 50 year, 50th birthday party. And so James Earl Jones and I were on a bus going from the hotel, and it was the only seat left was next to him. And I sat down next to him, and I go, James, I just have to tell you, it's been the dream of my life to meet you. And now I've met you and I've acted with you. And now we're going to George Lucas's birthday together. And he goes, we acted together. <laughs> we acted together. I go, well, we didn't really have a scene together, but we were kind of in the same scene, but we didn't talk to each other at the movie in Thailand. And we, we were in the jungles of Thailand and you were in that movie. He goes, my God, I'm getting old old so <laughs> old you know when you sit with me you just feel old you feel older but that was like one of the great special things was meeting james earl jones um in terms of movies you know the, those things were special and if you ask me the question tomorrow i probably have three different answers but but those were enormously special um Great Balls of Fire, you know. That I was, was a classic. I was in Memphis for four months. I, I, I had a contract where I was I shot the first day and the last day. And, and I was, I'd never been on a picture for so long. Not only did I shoot in Memphis for four months, but I went to England for almost a month, like three weeks, to shoot the English scenes from Great Balls of Fire. And that was when 
uh, I discuss, <laughs> this was uh, b before uh, Thailand, I discovered that my wife was pregnant. And she, wa she was pregnant and was morning sickness and everything when we were together in, in uh, London and uh, doing Great Balls of Fire. But that was fabulous because I did not have that big of a part in Great Balls of Fire. So I had a lot of free time in Memphis, and I went to all the blues clubs. And I spent my time listening to great blues players uh, every night, eating barbecue, drinking beer, and listening to the blues. How can you do that and get paid for it? It was just phenomenal. So I'll, I'll leave it at those. Those were like remarkable times in my life. There is a movie I want to talk about, and... I know it's not a great film, but it was part of my childhood. I still watch to this day, Mr. Magoo. Mr. Magoo. Mr. Magoo. Let me tell you something. <laughs> you know, the art director of Mr. Magoo was the same art director who did Mississippi Burning. That so, is so vastly different that it's hard to believe. It's amazing, but that's, you know, what an artist he is. Uh just Mr. Magoo, this was uh, a really interesting film. I spent a lot of my time uh, with, with Ernie Hudson, who is salt of the earth, greatest guy in the world. If you're going to be doing a long run with somebody, you want to be with Ernie beca because he's very cool, uh, sweet guy, generous guy, loving guy, and he's a wonderful actor to act with. But... Um, uh, our director, Stanley, Stanley Tong, I believe it was Stanley Tong was our director on that. He was Jackie Chan's stunt double when Jackie Chan needed a stunt double. Usually Jackie Chan doesn't have a stunt double. So Stanley was our director, and so we had all of the kung fu, his whole kung fu team helping us to do all the stunts and fights in Mr. Magoo. And Stanley had this theory about st actors doing stunts, doing their own stunts, like people like me, is that the actor begins the stunt and ends the stunt, and then you, you have the stunt man do the whole thing from beginning to end. And so what you have is you actor starts the stunt, cut, actor leaves, stunt man comes in dressed like the actor, does the whole stunt up and then he leaves, and then we see where the stunt man is ended up in the stunt. Then you dress up the actor, put blood on him, or in my case, blood and bruises, and and then they put you in the position that the guy ended up in. And then when they cut it together, it's like seamless. That was his that was his style. So do you remember what my stunt was in Mr. Magoo? I'm guessing the scene where you hang on the coat and you pull your feet up. Am I right? God, no, no. The real stunt was when I'm walking on the stage and I get hit by the catapult and I fly up into the top of the tree, right? So I'm, I'm in the overcoat. I, I'm, I'm in the coat and everything. And I walk on the bottom of this catapult and then they drop this weight on the catapult. And I fly up into the top of this tree and I get stuck in the, t in the top of this tree. Uh, so the, the stunt was this, I, I'm, we had some Canadian fellows who are our assistants and we go into the men's room and he gives me this kind of girdle jockstrap cont contraption. And he says, now I want you to put this in, put this on and make sure this fits right. Okay, make sure it fits right. Now, he's Canadian, which means Canadians have a problem with getting to the point. No harm against Canadians, but they don't say things clearly. So he's saying to me, I just want you to make sure it's right. Make sure it's, you know, it's right. And I said, I'm sorry. Look, I need to know what right means. I need to know what right means. Just make sure everything's all together. And I go, look, 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 please be specific. I need you to be specific. Make sure your balls are on the inside of the suit and tucked up. 
because if anything is outside the suit, when the rope pulls, because the rope is going to be attached to this rubber suit, when the rope pulls, it's going to go, whoop, and it's going to pull, and, and it'll castrate you. I said, Ooh. that's what we want to know. <laughs> that's the story. Don't say, get it old, get it, yeah, give me. No, we want the main story. In the, don't bury the lead. We want the main story on the front page. You will lose your junk if you don't do this right. You know, you'll lose, you know, you're going to be a, a, a eunuch. And, and so now I'm terrified. So I said, okay, give me a little privacy. So I put on this girdle kind of thing that, goes under my crotch and everything is everything's pulled up and there's a hook it goes to this hook underneath my overcoat and that is where they hook a, a rope and it goes up and they throw it up over the kind of stage works way, way it had a pulley way up at the top and it came over to not a machine not nothing but something like three guys Three guys on the other side holding it, and when they dropped the weight on there, the three guys jumped off of the balcony on the other side off camera, and they go, and my weight, and I'm just flying up in the air, and I ended up caught in the branches of the tree. And they had to get the our, our Canadian helpers to get like major ladders to pull me out of the tree. And then they had to have the stump man land in the tree you know, land in the tree the way they really wanted it. And then I had to go back when he finished, get in his exact position and redo it. And that was Stanley's method for having real actors do stunts. And all the actors in Mr. Magoo did their own stunts to that extent. And and I mean, uh, Nick Chindlin, he fell down a flight of stairs. And, you know, so he started going down a flight of stairs, stopped, cut, then they come down and then they say, okay, fall down the last six stairs. And then they had a stunt man do the whole fall all the way down the stairs. Nick Nick got the worst of it in it. I mean, he he always got clobbered in that movie. <laughs> yes, but. I remember. Uh, my, my grandfather and I used to laugh so hard in that movie. I mean, I think most of your scenes were our favorites because like the scene where you're trying to infiltrate the house and like the scene I just mentioned – where you hide in the overcoat. I mean, we just start busting up laughing. <laughs> it was, you know, Stanley was a great, great, great action director. And his entire team was amazing. And if I had been more of an athlete, if I had been, had more training in, in that kind of aspect of filmmaking, I could have learned so much from him. Because St St Stanley, if I, I'm trying to remember this correctly, he won, I want to say, it was certainly a Canadian record when he was in high school for the long jump. When he was in high school, he, he jumped long, he won the Canadian record, and it could have even been a world record uh, of the distance he had jumped, when he, certainly for his age. But it was like this huge, huge jump. And that was the logic behind him having Jackie Chan do the stunt where Jackie Chan jumps off of the building and goes through a window across the street because they measured the distance and the distance was about whatever Stanley was able to jump. And so Jack, you know, I, both of those guys are like the most amazing athletes. And it was great. I met Jackie Chan because he came to see Stanley while we were on the set. And Jackie Chan took us all out to dinner, which was – you. Jackie Chan in these movies is always humble and like almost a country bumpkin kind of rube with, with this kind of – with these high-tone kung fu skills. In mm -hmm. life, when Jackie Chan walks into a restaurant, he's treated like the king of the world. When he walks into a restaurant, everything stops. And, uh, you know, the most gracious guy in the world, but it's like you you realize you are with cinematic royalty. It was it'd almost be like if you were with Bruce Lee. It, it, it's like that kind of reverence for him and his ability. So, you know, you want to you be with Jackie Chan. That's one thing you really want to do. 
So is it true that you were originally supposed to play Al in Home Improvement? Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, this is this goes right to the uh, question about, uh, I guess, everything from great, was it the, the show I did in Thailand, you know, the last flight out, and uh, Great Balls of Fire, all of this stuff. So I was, I auditioned for Home Improvement. I did network tests for Home Improvement. And I was offered the role. Now, my wife was pregnant at the time. We, we, we had just gotten married. Annie was pregnant. And they said, well, this is the deal. We don't know if we're going to start this, the pilot in 10 days, 10 weeks, or 10 months. And my salary was, I want to get this right, was like, I think, $16,000 a week. Maybe it was 17000 But for me, at that time, that was like a truckload of money uh, to do a week. You're going to make this money, but you're not going to make it a week at the beginning because what they do is they do a pilot first, and then you get the pilot and the holding fee, so that's usually 16 times 2, so that'd be $32,000. And then you wait to see if they pick up the show. They may cancel the show. They may not. They may not decide. You have to wait till they decide if they pick up the show and then start shooting. So if they weren't going to shoot the pilot for 10 months, and I ha they had it in my contract that I was not allowed to work on any other shows. I was not allowed to audition for anything else. I was, I was theirs. They, they, they had me locked down to the contract. But they weren't going to lock themselves down as to when they were going to start shooting. And so I told them, 10 days is fine. I can even go without working 10 weeks and do the pilot, but I can't do 10 months. I can't do 10 months without working because I have a baby on the way. I have house payments to make. I'm not a, a rich person. I, I don't have this bank account that I could live off of my own fat you know that i've stored over the winter for 10 months i i need i need money so they compromised and they said we'll allow you to do one other show in between when we decide to do it and start and i just i cuddled up with my dear one annie and i just said baby this is nuts but i don't think i could do this job because if I sign the contract, they have me for whenever they want to shoot me. If it's 10 months, I'm screwed. We're screwed. And uh, I couldn't be in any other show. I could, and not only that, but once I signed the contract, I was theirs for seven years. So they had me exclusively for seven years regardless of, of uh, when they were going to do it or what my part would evolve into unless they would fire me along the way which could happen too. So eventually I had to make one of the hardest, certainly hardest career decisions of my life at that time and just said, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then looking back, lucky me, you know, had I had signed that contract, I would have been under contract with them for uh, Groundhog Day. I wouldn't have been able to do Ned. I wouldn't have been able to do it. Yes, I would have been a multimillionaire. Multimillionaire had I done home improvements for seven years, playing Al the Tool Time Guy. I would have a fleet of Cadillacs. I would, I would, you know, eat out every night. I don't know. I don't know. I'd have better clothes than I have. <laughs> but I wouldn't have been able to do Groundhog Day. And I wouldn't have been able to do all the other movies I ended up doing. I would have been a TV star on Home Improvement, but that's all I would have been in my life. So I've had the chance of being in motion pictures and doing all sorts of things. And there's another movie I've got to ask about that I think you were supposed to be in with Tom Green. Um, Freddie got... <laughs> Freddie got fingered. Yes. And, and I... I, I we had so much fun doing that. Tom and I, we had so much fun doing that. And they completely cut me out of the movie. And, and that was a big loss. 
I mean, I've got to say, I, I watched some of the deleted scenes, and her parts looked really funny too. Well, I thought they, I, and when we shot them, they seemed funny, and uh, it, you know, obviously, when when you shoot these things. It's rare that you shoot it and you go like, well, that stinks. We're going to have to cut this out of the movie. You know, you shoot it and you go like, this is terrific. But I think what happened was my part was predominantly, if you were to divide Freddy Got Fingered into three acts, I was pretty much in act one, everything. So it's quite possible they ended up with a four-hour movie, you know, when they finished shooting. And they thought, well, let's shorten it. What if we just start it here? We don't need all this preamble to it. Let's just start it here. And they just cut out Act One, which was me. And uh, it was unfortunate. I mean, I had a great time. I had a great time working with Tom. We had, I mean, we laughed so hard doing that show. We we had a great time. And again. You know, one of the main reasons I wanted to do Freddy Got Fingered is because of Julie Haggerty. Is oh, that she, she's amazing. Amazing. She I always thought of her as one of the great great actresses ever since Airplane. I thought, who is this woman? I am I am just crazy about this woman. And when I heard that she was gonna do Freddy Got Fingered, I I was like adamant to do it. And also my kids wanted me to do something with Tom Green because they were such huge fans of Tom Green. So I went to do the audition for Freddy Got Fingered. And I auditioned for Tom, and I came back, and my eldest son, Robert, said, Dad, congratulations. And I said, Robert, Robert, I just auditioned. He says, no, you got the part. He, and I go, what do you mean? I just auditioned, and I just drove home. He says, no, no, it just came up on the computer, uh, on my feed. Uh, under IMDb or IMDb, it just filled in with Freddie Got Fingered, so you got the part. So my son, the computer whiz, told me I got the part right after I auditioned. So that was great, and Julie Haggerty was in it. So unfortunately, my scenes were always shot on weeks that Julie Haggerty was in Los Angeles. And then Julie came out to Canada to shoot her scenes when I had to go back, so I never got to see Julie except in passing, like in the lobby, as I'm going to the airport, I saw Julie. But I, don't, I forget when Freddie Got Figure came out, in the year... 2001, 2000, I think? Around, so we were shooting around the year 2000, let's say. So we're, you know, we're shooting it a year before it comes out. So probably around 2000. In 2001, I auditioned for a play on Broadway, and I got it. And my girlfriend in the play was Julie Haggerty. And we were on Broadway, Babes on Broadway, in New York, in a hit play. And we ran for just about a year. And then we, we got all the actors, most of them were from Los Angeles. We said, we're tired of being in New York. Can you imagine that? Your whole life, you're a young actor. You want to get a job, get a part. Finally, you get a part on Broadway. Finally, you're in a hit on Broadway. And it's you're doing 95% capacity every night. You've been doing it for nine, ten months. And then you tell the producers, I want to go home. I don't want to do this anymore. And so it was hard. It was hard having two addresses, me in New York and my wife and kids in L.A. Everybody was feeling the same thing. Julie wanted to go back. Uh, Buck Henry, Buck lived in both places he wanted to go. Everybody wanted to go back uh, except the people who lived in New York. And uh, we ended up doing the play for another two and a half months in Los Angeles at the Amundsen when we came back. So that was uh, the spawn of Freddie Got Fingered as I finally got to uh, meet and become friends with Julie. So what was it like, and I asked you this on Facebook, what was it like on Dweebs? Dweebs, I think we had a, we had a great time on the set. Uh, we had a wonderful creative team, wonderful writers. Uh, 
so we 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 had a great time on the set and we felt like in the beginning we thought well this this show is kind of dopey but you know it's about something that's real in that again it's a stranger in the strange land kind of story i i think when i take a look at a movie script or a tv script i try to say what is the real story and usually the story is the hero's journey which you could say was dweebs where farrah forky was our hero right she's the person in dweebs who knows nothing about computers and we're rooting for her and at the same time you're rooting for all of us guys to come uh, you know, to make our our high tech invention, you know, our programs work. Uh, but it really was a stranger in a strange land, because at that time computers were. I think I mentioned like the most powerful computer was like the Mac Five Twelve. Oh yeah. And it didn't even have a hard drive. You had to buy a hard drive, and the hard drive, which was incredibly small. A small. I mean, it was giant on your desk, but it was small in terms of, uh, you know, RAM that you could hold. It would cost like two thousand dollars. I mean, computing was so expensive, and you know, it was big and clumsy and clunky. So it was just these instruments of magic and destruction were just coming into the hands of the common man, and dweebs had its finger on the pulse, and you had Farrah Forky a beautiful stranger in a strange land who doesn't know anything about computers, but she knows about human behavior. And you have all of these guys who are dweebs, social mis misfits, uh, too shy, too bashful, can't get along with people. And so you have them teaching her about computers and her teaching them about how to live as civilized human beings. And it was wonderful. It was a wonderful idea and a wonderful show. Peter Noah was our executive producer. Just brilliant, brilliant guy. He, he, he's done so many great television shows along the way. Here's another guy, you know, I learned a lot from, Peter Noah. But it just, I think we were opposite Jeff Foxworthy, I want to say, at the time. Uh -huh. But we... You know, Jeff Foxworthy got a lot of the won the won the hours or whatever, but but uh, we did really well. We we beat everybody else except the number. We were usually like number two for that night, and also it didn't help that David Letterman was making fun of us at night. I think he was on NBC at the time, and and he was making fun of dweebs and saying, "Well, at least I'm not on the TV show Dweebs," you know, and he was every night was just making a David Letterman type joke about <clears throat> how stupid the show Dweebs was, even though he had never seen it. Shame on him. But, but yeah, you know, that's, that's comedy. And so it kind of shamed people from watching Dweebs because they thought it would be stupid because David Letterman is very smart, very funny. So if he hates it, I doubt if he had seen it. So it was just a matter of timing. Yeah, I, I think what people see it as is like a prototype for the big bang theory and me yes. i think it's funnier than the big bang theory especially the chemistry between carl and vic i mean i just love how feldman teases your character throughout the run of the show he gets some pretty funny one-liners in there and carl yes. is probably my favorite character <laughs> yeah carl i i played carl on that carl was a great character uh but you know, it, you know Peter Scolari and David Kaufman, Corey. You know, it's just like wonderful, wonderful cast. Uh, you know, just it was great going to work every day and great. You know, Corey was Corey Feldman. He was like a total lunatic, as you know. <laughs> but, but 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 I mean that not in a dangerous way, but in a kind of hilarious, ridiculous way. So. <laughs> You, you know, he would show up, you know, to work with kind of a limousine with a driver. <laughs> and, you, you know, it's like, huh? And, and, you know, and he'd have like a come with bodyguards, you know, like, and it's like, 
no one's going to attack you here, man. You're you're in safe you're in safe territory here. It was <sighs> Corey was a nut, but but he was you know he was great at that stuff. He he had a ton of experience, and uh, he was like the old true you know the war horse among us and and Peter Scolari too of course were were like the troopers you know they've been in so many shows before dweebs and dweebs you know i i hadn't been in that many at the time so so it was great for me yeah and now nowadays you're in like the goldbergs which is a right. classic and just several shows now that are just hilarious and i do think like home improvement did miss out on a good golden opportunity but man i really wished weaves had an official dvd release <laughs> yeah yeah that would have been that would have been great but also you know at the time i'm trying to think i think dvds were not a thing that had happened yet or or were not common at the time be because when we finish with dweebs you know, I got a series of videotapes of our shows, you know, which are rapidly deteriorating. And you were so kind as to uh, put together a real DVD of Dweebs, which I thank you very much for. But, you know, all of my videotapes of Dweebs are deteriorating. And, you know, it's it's not a format that's made to last. And, and you know, the, the DVD was. I... I uh, Trying to think when DVDs really started happening. I think they started happening more in like the early 2000s, and then they became the main thing in like 2007. Uh huh. And now they're gone again. Yep. Now it's Blu ray or just streaming. Streaming. <laughs> I'm streaming. a physical media nut. I still have a VCR. <laughs> like my wife and I, you, you, you see behind me here, I'm going to move this screen a little bit. You see this? Like this, you see books you see this is like nothing we this is one of the two libraries we have this is this is what we call the religious and uh philosophy books library religious books there's the mishnah and the talmud over here uh prayer books right over here the jewish prayer books and dictionaries there so this is like religious stuff and philosophy in this room. We have 4,000 books. And my wife spent two years with a library program and cataloged each book and where they're located. So when you take a book off of the shelf, you must put it back in the <laughs> same spot or my wife's two years work is wasted. And... and it, and we were sitting down at dinner the other night, and, and it's all because, you know, she was an English major in college, and she with a specialty in pre-Shakespearean literature, so she was able to read uh, some Swedish, Middle English, uh, all, all sorts of those weird pre-English languages. So we have a bunch of books of hers that, like, you can't even read. And, you know, different versions of Chaucer and Shakespeare and all that stuff in the other room. And so she was one of these people who read a lot and loved books and had a lot of books. And I'm this person who my first job was reading books to a blind woman when I was in college. And, and that was the first time I really began to read a lot and think like, oh, I love this. So I began to be more interested and buy books at the time. Uh, so in our house, we were sitting down last week, and she said, you know, if the pandemic continues and everything deteriorates, our libraries in this house are going to be so important because the streaming stuff will be gone. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, once you pull the plug on streaming, it's over. It's gone. If there's no power and and here we have the physical books and people are going to want to come and sit and read you know read kid books I'm a grandfather now so I just can't wait to read uh, Goodnight Moon to my little granddaughter 
and I don't have to take her to the computer screen to show her it. I could just sit down with the book at her bedside and read it to her. It's nothing like it. Well, don't feel bad. I mean, I have a collection of Blu-rays and DVDs. They fill the entire wall <laughs> under the TV in the garage. <laughs> what what is the genre that you love the most? Well, I'm a comedy guy. I love comedies, but then there's my science fiction kicks. And I also love just about anything. I mean, some days I'll watch Blade Runner or Star Wars. Some days I'll watch something simple like Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, Groundhog Day. Just I'm a movie guy in general. Uh, I, I would I would say I'm I'm kind of in the same category as you. I'm a comedy guy and a science fiction guy. You know those those are the movies that I've always loved in my life. And then as I've grown older and like you know I like dramas too now. You know and you know, kind of the character movies. I, I like some of those too. But, you know, before we had tons of uh, Blu-rays and DVDs of all sorts of movies, you know, just all sorts of things. And we'd sit at home at night and just have movie night. Haven't so much lately in the pandemic. No, uh, you, you don't get to do that as much anymore. I mean, uh, throughout the past two years, I've just mainly worked. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. I, I work in a grocery store, so I'm always. They always need me there. So <laughs> they always need you. Yeah, I mean, it's the most important place to go. It's and fortunately, you know, I've reached the age where I could do senior shopping. Uh, you, you know, where they open the stores early if you're 65 and older, because of COVID. So, you know, I'm. Either my wife or myself are able to go there at 6.30 in the morning and do all the shopping while they're still packing the shelves with things. But you realize it's how close you are to the, to the with, with the supply problems and the supply shortages and everything going to stores. You realize how close you are to things breaking down. Oh, yeah. Now, I do, now speaking of science fiction, I've got yep. one more movie I'd love to talk about. Yep. Baseballs. Spaceballs. Spaceballs. Amazing. Uh, I was doing a, uh, a play at Los Angeles Theater Center with Bill Pullman. Uh, we, we, this crazy Norwegian came over and first directed Three Sisters, in which was the first play I did at LATC, Los Angeles Theater Center. And then the crazy Norwegian directed this play, Barabbas, starring Bill Pullman. And I had a part in it, and the woman, Ann Hearn, who was going to become my wife, had a part in it. And so Bill and I were in part of this theater company, and Ann knew Bill from another theater company, too, so we all knew each other. And, you know, Bill was just saying, oh, I'm going to be doing this Mel Brooks movie uh, soon, Spaceballs, and, you know, based on Star Wars, and where I'll go, oh, congratulations, congratulations. And then after one of our shows, Bill says, Stephen, there may be a part for you in Spaceballs. Would you like to meet Mel and try out for it or something? I go, well, sure, I'd love to. So Bill, Mel Brooks came to see our show, our, our play, Barabbas. And Bill was magnificent in it. My wife was very good in it. And afterwards, Mel Brooks met me in the lobby. He says, how would you like... How would you like to have this part in Spaceballs? You know, how would you like, you know, this, is, and I'm going like, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, just come over to my office and we'll have an audition. We'll have an audition. You know what an audition is? You'll come and you'll do the part for me. And then I'll talk to you and then we'll do it again. You know, and I go, well, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I called up my mother and father and said, you won't believe it. I have an audition with Mel Brooks. And this was huge because... Out of all the people in L.A., my mother and father didn't know anybody. You know, they wouldn't know if I were to say, oh, Howard Fuhrer, the casting director, called me in to read for uh, Alan Parker, you know, Mississippi Burning. And they wouldn't know anything about those names. They don't know any of those people. But Mel Brooks, they knew. And so they thought, oh, this could be a sign of our child's success. <laughs> so I went in. I auditioned for Mel, and he goes, "Okay, now can you do can you do it bigger? Come in and do it bigger." 
And being someone who loved Mel Brooks films, I knew what he meant by bigger. And so, you know, I did about, hey, he says, okay, fine, you'll do the part. And you're going to do the part. And what, we'll give you, we'll give you what, maybe $1,000, $1,000 for the day. We'll shoot it one day, you give it, give you $1,000 for the day. And I go like, great, that's wonderful. So they called me up and they said, uh, well, Stephen, you're going to shoot your scene on Monday. So I came on Monday. I'm sitting there with Rick Moranis, John Candy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going like, oh, my God. Oh, this is, like, amazing. And I sat there all day, and they never got to my scene. <laughs> and they said, well, come back tomorrow. So I came back the next day, never got to my scene. Came back Wednesday, never got to my scene. Thursday, never got to my scene. And I said, listen, you know, I understand that it's not the most important scene in the movie, but can you at least, could somebody, I mean, I'm here, <laughs> you know, I'm waiting to do it. And the uh, assistant director, the AD, they call him, says like, what's your problem? I said, well, I've been waiting here four days. He says, you get paid every day you're here. And I go, what? You, you mean I'm making $1,000 a day just to sit here and eat the snacks? I go, yeah. <laughs> oh, fine. Take your time. I thought I was just sitting here. You know, no. And we shot it Friday. So, so you mean I made $5,000 for this part instead of one? Holy mackerel. This is the kind of job I want where you get paid for doing nothing. So, you know, it was huge that way. And then we all went to the premiere and the show was so funny. And my part, you know, not only got huge laughs in, in the movie theater, but applause. You know, you captured their stunt double. So I thought like, well, one much, but at least, you know, it for for whatever it was, it was successful. So I uh I have lo and I worked with Mel again in uh Mad About You. And I I remember I I was the principal of the school. I always seem to play principals now. I, I was principal of the school, and he was taking classes. He was like Uncle Phil wanting to take some classes at the high school. And, he, of course, he's disrupting all the classes. So it was just great because I walked in, met Mel, uh, Mel again on Mad About You. goes, and we work together. We work together on space balls. And I go, that's <laughs> right, sir. We did. We did. And... Uh, so that was a great experience. Uh, so Spaceballs was a great experience, and it's rightly, you know, you know, satires of movies rarely can be successful because the movies get old, and we forget what they were. We don't know what the references are anymore, and the you know, time marches on, as we discussed at the beginning. Time marches on, and we don't know what we're making fun of. But that isn't true with Star Wars, because Star Wars, George Lucas made such an amazing, amazing film that it spawned like an entire culture, and it will never, I, you know, I can never say never, but at least this year, it's not going to go out of style. And everybody knows all those characters, and they love Spaceballs. It's a fantastic film. I mean... I've probably seen it about a million and a half times. So, <laughs> and, and, and always the line, everyone on this ship is an asshole. It just gets me <laughs> laughing so hard. <laughs> oh. oh, it's great. It's great. It's great. It's just wonderful. It's wonderful to go to a comedy. I think I saw that in the theater that is now El Capitan which is a big theater here in Los Angeles, big fancy theater now. But back then it was just a big theater on Hollywood Boulevard. And to have a full house of people laughing and clapping from beginning to end, it's just amazing. It's amazing. I don't know if I've seen comedies do that. And certainly no one's been in a movie theater for a couple of years, so it's hard to say. But to, to have that kind of laughter that's usually only reserved for stage plays, the theater, but have Mel be able to create that on film, something so continually hilarious. It's just wonderful. Well, I do want to say thank you so much for being a guest. It has been an honor to have you on. 
Well, certainly, Tim, it has been a pleasure pleasure to meet you after all this time. Uh, bumping into you on Facebook, it's, it's been a pleasure. And um, it, it's always nice talking about uh, things that I don't usually talk about, which, which is all these early projects that I was involved with, and they're probably the ones that mean the most to me. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so much I could keep going on about, but we'd be going on for two or three hours if we did. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, there are so much. I mean, I enjoyed your character on Freaky Friday. Yeah. And I just, I don't know. You just bring an enjoyment and charisma to almost every performance I've seen. And your character is instantly my favorite right when I see him. It's like, hey, <laughs> I know him. <laughs> I love this guy. Terrific character actor. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. You know, I've, I've been lucky in that a lot of the parts I play haven't been just like wallpaper. You know, that they actually do something in the movie rather than just being a perfunctory part. I mean, certainly early in my career I played district attorney you know i always go like the part is important if you have two names like ned ryerson clayton townley y you know if you have two names then they thought about your part uh early in my career you know i played security guard you know i played fbi agent you know when they don't even think of a name then you know you're in trouble because because they don't know anything about this part so I'm lucky to have played people with names. Well, I think one of the most memorable names, and the only reason I remember it is because of the name from Mr. Magoo, Detective Stupak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, God. Just hearing that name alone can make you bust up laughing. Yeah, yeah. It was wonderful. Yeah, it was great. And another one of my favorite scenes is between you and Ernie Hudson. Ernie Hudson says, there's a mysterious character, suspicious character. He's got a, needs a haircut. Turn around. He's right behind you. And he looks and it's the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> I just start busting up. It's just like, that's amazing. And I think it's your character's <laughs> expression that just sells the whole scene when he goes, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that that was wow! What a what a that was an adventure. Shooting that movie was an adventure, just because of Stanley and us having to do our own stunts. That was like, yeah, I still get the heebie-jeebies when I think of some of the scenes we shot. <laughs> just yeah. <laughs> well, is there anything else you'd like to say before we close out? Uh just just it's a delight that we have this Zoom thing happening and we're able to talk about the things we love and appreciate you reaching out and uh we talk about the things we love i i realize that people need to reach out because other people are their mirrors you know not the mirrors and mr magoo but other people hmm. the stories become like these things on the bookshelf you know they become our little books that kind of protect us so it's nice to have this opportunity and i thank you and I thank you.